My name is Alex Pius. I'm a PCA for the Dune Company of Yuma. I'm a recent graduate from the University of Arizona, class of 2020. I received my PCA license about a year ago, and I've been working with uh, Dune Company of Yuma for about a year and a half. I've experienced uh, walking head lettuce, romaine, broccoli, cauliflower, onions, spinach, uh, cotton, alfalfa, citrus, a little bit of everything that we grow out here in the desert southwest. Today I'm going to take you guys along with me, show you a typical day in my life. Uh, we're going to be walking lettuce, checking for any, any kind of abnormality in the field, which it, it could be insects, uh, diseases, and then we'll communicate with the growers and let them know what we're finding so we can come up with a good plan, IPM plan. Uh, so this is our first stop of the day. Uh, we're out here in the Yuma Valley. It's the middle of November. Uh, this is a three-line uh, head lettuce field that's been in the ground for approximately you know, 30 to 40 days. Um, with the weather breaking, um, starting to move a little bit slower, but you also are gonna start seeing, you know, like mildew popping up. So we're gonna walk and make sure we don't have any mildew in here. Uh, this field was just sprayed last night with a six hour reentry time uh, product. Uh, so we're gonna walk in, you know, check our check our kill and make sure we don't have any anything else popping up that's not supposed to be in here. All right, so uh, what we're doing here when we're walking across, we'll occasionally stop and uh, pick a couple heads of lettuce up, you know, just make sure to take a look at everything around uh, the, the plant itself. Uh, be trying to look for, you know, mildew, any, any type of damage to the plant. And as we go, we're gonna peel back uh, the leaves. So after scouting this field, uh, one thing we did find was a little bit of a downy mildew popping up. What I'll do is I'll contact the, the grower, the farmer, and let him know what I found and what way I want to approach uh, the situation, what chemicals I want to use, what rates I want to use. And after coming to terms on what I'm going to spray and being allowed, I will write up a 1080 form and send it to the office where it will be revised, made sure that the chem chemical I'm using is uh, under label for the crop and that my rates are under the label as well. Um, after that, after it's revised and everything checks out, what we'll do is send that chemical over to the applicator where then it will be applied either by ground or air, uh, depending on the situation. Um, I guess uh, 
like we've uh, mentioned before, uh, when we're walking these fields, what we, what we do, you know, we're gonna walk across uh, the field. Um, sometimes in a straight line, sometimes you're moving up and down. Um, usually try not to walk too much in a straight line. But what I'm gonna do is, um, today I'm gonna walk in from the northeast corner, down to the west corner, and go up and down, you know, kind of zigzag my way through the field. And uh, periodically we're gonna stop and, you know, check some some heads of lettuce and uh, as well as uh, stopping and taking a look across the field. Uh, it's, it's pretty good when you stop and take a look because uh, you can spot stuff just by by looking, you know, taking a, taking a minute and just look across the whole field, you'll, you'll be able to spot stuff, um, any abnormality in the field, whether it's a disease, uh, some virus, or, you know, even, even some mildew, you can spot it from afar. So uh, that's what I'm gonna be doing. So I just finished walking this field. Um, everything looks pretty good. It's pretty clean. Um, I'm on to the next one. Thank you guys for joining me. I'll see you guys later. I'm in a bit of a hurry today. Um, checked the last week. Looks pretty good. Um, just come back next week. As PCAs, we don't usually just drive around our fields and take a look at our window and say everything looks good. Uh, we actually have to put our boots in the ground and put the hours into it, uh, walking our fields, because any pest, whether it's an insect, you know, bacteria, fungal disease, or anything like that, um, can generate and grow rapidly, whether it's in the middle of your field, on the edge of your field, you know, it just can grow anywhere at any time. And you gotta just keep an eye on that. Make sure you're walking your blocks on a daily or every other day. Just make sure you, you put the hours in. Uh, never just drive by a field and say it looks all right because you never know what's happening, you know, not even five feet into your field. So we gotta stay in there and protect the crops. So I I was uh, I was pretty impressed for a young PCA that's only been doing it for about a year and a half. He's obviously been trained well by the people he works with. Uh, uh, my name is John Palumbo. I'm uh, uh, an extension specialist with the University of Arizona, located here at the UMAG Center. I'm in my office right now. We do a lot of research. We do a lot of outreach, educational programming with particularly with PCAs. That's, that's the, been the focus of my program for years is to work primarily with PCAs and then of course growers and other uh, aspects of the industry. Um, I, I think he, he defined what scouting really is uh, when it comes to fresh produce. Um, our statistics show that these guys are in the field four to five times a, a week. That's how intensive it is. A couple of things I'd point out that I think um, will change a little bit. One of them is size of the plant. I mean, he mentioned just a second ago that, oh, he's in a hurry and, you know, they've got a lot of ground to cover uh, and they do a good job. Um, smaller stuff uh, at stand establishment, uh, they can cover a lot more ground, obviously. The plants are so much smaller, get down on their hands and knees and crawl and they can see stuff. And they can make decisions much quicker because at that stage, when a plant's got one leaf, maybe two leaves, uh, it's very, very susceptible to damage, uh, particularly by insects. So it's not, it's easy to make a spray decision, a uh, control decision um, very rapidly. Something like the, the stage in November that he was looking at, it's a little bit more difficult. You've got to spend a little, some significant time and 
He's absolutely correct in terms of you either, you know, go to each four corners and, and scout around, go to the middle, or use a zigzag pattern like he uses. It, it doesn't matter. It's it's whatever you feel, and a lot, it comes a lot from experience and your gut that you've covered enough ground. And that's why we always say, when in doubt, scout. Um, the, uh, yeah, no, no, he, he, he covered a lot of good things there. Uh, the fundamentals, and as I would say for uh, IPM and desert vegetable crops, um, scouting's the, the foundation. It starts with scouting, because that's where all the control decisions are made. You either make a decision to treat or not to treat, uh, and that's, that's critical as opposed to the old days when we just treated on a schedule. Now it's it's more dialed in and these these PCAs like Alex they uh, I think they they clearly understand that. Um, you know one of the other aspects of, of uh, scouting that isn't relied a lot by the individual PCA or even the growers is the use of traps. Uh, we use them a lot because it kind of gives us a sense of what insect activity is going out there. And so now we'd like to shift over and talk a little bit in, uh, about trapping and some of the work we've done there to, to kind of uh, go along with the work that the PCAs do. Okay, we're here, now we're at the, um, uh, one of my trapping stations, one of my trapping locations that we use to monitor key insect pests that we find in lettuce throughout the course of the growing season. We actually have 16 of these locations situated throughout the Yuma area. Furthest east would be Texas Hill, all the way from there uh, into the Gila Valley, three locations there, all the way down south to San Luis, and then we actually even have a trapping location in the Bard Winter Haven area. The purpose for these traps is to kind of monitor the activity, essentially the flight activity of most of these uh, insects. And what we're measuring are adult activity. For instance, if you look behind me, you'll see the the uh, corn earworm trap, the white trap there. These two bucket traps here below me, those are for beet armyworm and cabbage looper, the moth, the adult. And what we do is we try to keep track of what those are doing throughout the course of the season, um, both at an individual location and then averaged across the entire area. Um, those have been pretty useful as, as in terms of real-time information. Uh, they're not something that a PCA would use to actually make a treatment decision, but it does kind of give them a heads up if, if in, in a particular growing region there's uh, increased or decreased activity of one of the LEP species, one of the worm species. Um, in that case, they do kind of, if you keep track of it, you kind of get a sense of, hey, maybe, maybe the activity is up a little bit. We've actually seen correlation with the corn earworm traps where when they tend to spike, in areas nearby, we tend to see the presence of corn earworm, and since that pest is so important, and you can't allow it to build up, it kind of it's definitely a red flag that you probably should intensify your monitoring in those lettuce surrounding lettuce blocks. Um, one thing we've recently noted was with beet armyworm traps is that we've correlated years when we've had real heavy pressure in the field with real high trap counts. And again, they're not a management decision, but as we get into early September, if you see real active, a lot of activity with beet armyworm in these traps, it's probably a pretty good indication that you're gonna have, or I should say the industry is gonna have a lot of activity that year. That's, that's the one thing that I think we gain most out of these traps um, above and beyond everything else is that it gives us historical trends that we've been able to look at over the past 10 years. And if, in that sense, it's really a really, really useful research tool. And so we're learning a lot about our, our overall populations and what they're doing. Um, and we kind of look back and see how that correlates with what we've observed over the years. So in many respects, they can have some real-time usage, but for me personally, they've been a real good uh, research tool uh, when you compare it with what's going in the field as well. The other trap that we use is this yellow sticky trap down here. That's just basically a 6 by 12 trap that we wrap around a post. So in essence, we, we capture insects flying from many different directions. And unlike the pheromone traps, which use a pheromone to attract the male species of the moth, these yellow sticky traps are attractive because of the color. Uh, insects that are moving flying through an area, spot the yellow and they're attracted to it. And of course, if they land on it, 
there's an adhesive on there that, that keeps them there. Um, and those are real useful, particularly with pests such as white flies. Um, we, we, you, can, you can track those pretty easily. You know when they peak, and when you see an uptick in those numbers, it generally correlates to what's going on in the field. You start getting reports of heavy numbers in the field. We also pick up thrips, and those have been, the information we've generated there has been a really, really useful in terms of trying to understand the dynamics of thrips, particularly now that we're dealing with INSV. We have a pretty good sense of when their peak activity is in terms of their flights. We also pick up aphids, and aphids are unusual because aphids are not around very often. Excuse me, let me back up. They're not, aphids aren't uh, resident populations. In, in essence, they disappear in the summer. There are cool season pests, as we've discussed in other modules, as you'll hear in other modules. There are cool season pests that, that tend to do real well in our winter temperatures, such as January, February, and March. By the time May comes around, they're gone. Uh, they basically don't survive our summers. Um, so you, you might wonder, well, how do, we, how do they reappear every October, November? Well, when the winds start to shift and start coming out of the north, that's when the aphids start blowing in from some of the higher elevation areas of California and they just go downwind and eventually deposit themselves in Imperial Valley first and then here in Yuma. So those traps are a pretty good indicator because right now, and since about uh, the 1st of June, probably the 1st of May, we've not been catching anything on these traps all summer long. Then all of a sudden, about, about early October, we'll start to catch these aphids on these traps, which is an indication that they're starting to move into the growing area. And we always use that as a red flag as well to give PCAs a heads up that, hey, we're starting to pick up aphids on the sticky traps you probably, if you're not already, going to start picking them up on the plants. And that's, again, the winged form that would be the, the form that would essentially begin the colonization of a lettuce plant. The last plant we, the last trap we have is that what we call a wing trap. That's the one down at the very end, small trap. That's for diamondback moth. It's a, you can see we have three different designs. They all use a pheromone that attracts the male species, but they have different designs. And a lot of that's based on the behavior of the insect. Diamondback moth traps are really useful because, again, same thing, it gives us an indication the diamondback's starting to show up because, much like aphids, they disappear in the summer. Not because of the temperature, but because there's no brassica host. Diamondback are very selective, very specific to brassicas, coal crops, uh, broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, etc. And since there are none available in the summer in the desert, they basically just become extinct, if you will only to reappear again in September, either on, on storms coming out of the south, some of the monsoons, some of the remnants of some of the hurricanes that come up, and or transplants. So we place a lot of those traps on the edges of newly transplanted fields, newly direct seeded fields, and when you start to see spikes in the numbers, there's a good indication that activity's begun. Either So they've come into the valley one way or the other whether on trap, uh, on the winds, or whether on transplants, you're starting to get movement into the valley. So in many respects, these traps and this network is most uh, helpful for the average PCA because it kind of gives them an indication of when things are starting to happen uh, before they actually happen in the field or as they're happening in the field. Okay, now we're gonna move over to some research plots here at the Ag Center and look at some, uh, some lettuce at stand establishment and look at some of the pests that affect those, those, uh, those plants when they're very small, namely beet armyworm and cabbage looper. Yeah, the, the, the issue is, this is always the problem, whether it's early like this or it's after an application is, you're just not finding anything. And that's almost as hard a decision as anything else because am I, are they just not here or am I missing them? And that's why we came up with that term, when in doubt, scout. Well, if you doubt it, just keep scouting. And after you've looked enough, You'll, you'll be able to say, especially people with experience, you know, they should be here. Something like army worm, this is artificial because it's only an acre, but oftentimes you'll see them, they, they tend to aggregate, most insects aggregate in patches across the field, but a lot of times you'll find them along the edges first. Um, and then you, but you need to sample the, the whole field. The other place notorious for finding insects, not only army worm, is under power lines. You know, a lot of these fields are butt up against power lines and airplanes don't do a very good job around power lines. Um, and ground rigs sometimes, 
they do okay, but the problem is you got people going up and down the road all day and all that dust is settling on that plant and that can, that can affect your pe pesticide, your insecticide performance. Right there on top of the leaf. That's a third, that's probably, that, that probably a three or four day old worm. And he probably, he may have moved, he may have knocked the plant out or you can see the damage to the side, but he's a, that's about a three day old worm, maybe four. But they've got that, that off green, dull green color. Whereas the cabbage looper, when they get mature like that, they, they have almost a lime green color. They're pretty distinctive. The feeding's distinctive. So you can see where he's been feeding, right there on top of the leaf. That's fresh damage. It's a cool morning in October. There's a third in. That's, that's, see, he's getting some size to him right there. Beet or a beet army worm, yeah. You can see where he's just been feeding on top of that leaf. Obviously, he didn't get that size from feed, that little bit of feeding. He probably knocked a plant out, and it, that's why they call them army worm because they tend to march a lot right down the seed line. And they'll take one plant after another until they get satisfied. This is one that got hit real early. There's not much left of that. Of course, that'll never make a head, nor will this one. This one will never make a head. That's pretty well damaged. Even this one's stunted. That's why it's really important to keep them clean about this time because, even, you know, when you've got a bunch of small seedlings, one leaf cotyledons, you can't afford to get too many knocked out, but depending on how the grower plants, you know, is spacing. Um, but yeah, you know, a lot of that stuff gets knocked into the furrow, but if they've got size to them, they'll just walk back up. Classic window painting feeding coming from the bottom up you see that and then if you just probably I think he's right there isn't he? he's pretty small maybe not I don't know where he went they move around a lot and they're they're easy to knock off that's why you, the fresh, the presence of the fresh damage is really important because, like I say, you at a rough seedbed like this, you'll knock them off. You go, well, there's no worm there, but yeah, yeah, they, yeah, there is. You can tell because he's, that's all fresh, fresh feeding. That's old damage. See how it's all, it's not fresh, it's not green, it's not oozing plant juice. It's feeding that probably happened three, four days ago, maybe a couple of days ago. Worms long gone. Side. Here's something that we see occasionally, but not to the point where it really causes a lot of significant damage. And that's leaf miner. All that mining on that leaf there, that brown area, that's in, where um, a, a little fly lays its eggs and, a, and the maggot hatches within the leaf. You can actually see the larvae. That's it right there, it's dead. That's a result probably of parasitism. Important. There's two times during the lettuce season that's, that are real critical for for plant protection. The first one is the stand establishment. From the time the plant starts to emerge as a cotyledon until you get to the four or five leaf stage, you get to the four or five leaf stage when um, you start to thin it. At that point, that, that crop is real, real susceptible to worms, uh, army worm looper. That's real critical. and. In September, September and October, that is probably the primary pest that growers and PCAs deal with. Again, we'll talk about it later, but down the road, uh, when you near harvest, that's another important critical point uh, where you have to protect the marketable product, the head, the actual head, um, and it's pretty important at that time. And a proponent of what we do is look at new and existing chemistry and look at existing chemistry and, and compare it and so we know what works and what doesn't sort of the PCA I, I look at it 30 40 times they look at it 30 40 times in one week I look at it 30 40 times in three years they look at it 30 or 40 times in one week in, in the heat of the battle so you know we give them a heads up they kind of figure out what what works there are ineffective products but 
you know, the market, it gets sifted out in the market because guys can't afford, when lettuce is this big, you can't afford to get burned. You can't afford a lot of damage. So if a product's not performing, um, you don't do it. And, and to that point, there are two products that we use, Avant and Intrepid, which are effective, but they are have to be completely consumed. So a cabbage looper has to eat completely through the leaf because the insecticide is laying on top. It has to eat completely through the leaf to get it, and they're slow acting. Whereas these other products, the Radiant, the Corrigin, um, the Proclaims, those diamides, they're translaminar. When they hit the top of the leaf, they penetrate into the leaf tissue and create this reservoir within the leaf tissue. So anything eating on top of the leaf, like an army worm, or below the leaf, like a looper, picks them up right away. So those that's a choice. It's probably better made when you've got small lettuce as a translaminar product as opposed to one of these others that has to be ingested. So the plant gets a little bit bigger, you can afford to use something that has to be ingested, like a BT or like these uh, Intrepid or Avant. Those, those uh, you can afford a little more damage uh, and they're still probably in most cases going to get the job done. When I first started here in Yuma in leafy vegetables and melon production, growers basically had four to five different products with which to control insects. Most of those were pretty hard, uh, neurotoxins, um, hard on the environment. However, in the last 30 years, we've seen this dramatic shift in technology, particularly in uh, pesticide technology, where we've gone from broad spectrum hard chemistry to this really, really selective soft chemistry, which is not only very, very effective, um, but it's easy on the environment, easy on natural enemies, and most importantly, it's uh, safe for the consumer and for people that work in the fields. Now we're gonna visit with Macy Keith, who's gonna talk to us about organic production relative to IPM. And I think what we'll see is that there may be some slight differences between how we approach IPM and organic versus how we approach it in conventional lettuce production. Hi, my name is Macy Keith, and I've been at Arizona PCA since 2015. I graduated from the University of Arizona in 2014 and started working at the Maricopa Ag Center with Dr. Peter Ellsworth, and I did a lot with cotton research and cotton IPM. From there, I moved to Yuma, where I scouted organic and conventional produce in Welton, Yuma, and Imperial Valley. Today, I am a chemical and fertilizer rep for a company called San Agro, formerly known as Westbridge. Today, we are out in Yuma Valley. It's fall. What we have here is um, a younger planting after thinning, and this is the right time, essentially, to get your first application for an insect control. So if you can kind of hold off your pressures until this point, it's the right time. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and check some plants to see what kind of insects that I find. Uh, when you're looking at the plants, you want to make sure that the roots are nice and white and healthy. Uh, look on the bottom of the leaves. Uh, typically the army worm will lay um, egg clusters and the clusters have about 50 to 100 eggs in them and there's nice webbing over the top, so that's how you can really identify that they're the bee army worm. Um, here, right here, we do actually have a cluster. They're about ready to hatch. They can hatch within a couple days in these warmer weathers. Um, so this is the perfect time to apply because after they hatch, they'll start feeding, and then that's how we're gonna get a knockdown. We're definitely at threshold to spray. Um, three out of three plants is pretty bad, and if I were to make a decision based off of what I've seen, essentially I could be done walking and checking because I've met the threshold and I don't need to look anymore. But I'm gonna just check and see if we have any other bugs or some diseases such as powdery or downy mildew out here. 
check for the stand and plant establishment. Look at the roots and make sure the roots are white and healthy. So our next step after identifying the pest problem would be writing the recommendation and uh, picking the correct product for the time. Uh, right now, what we saw was the bee armyworm right at hatching. So we know that they're going to start feeding and that is going to be the most ideal time to knock down the pest. Um, the census is an organic field that we're working with. This could be the right time to use a traditional spinosad product because it will knock down your worms. It will also knock down any thrip that you have. And in the fall time, thrip are a heavy, heavily um, common pest. So you can go ahead and pull the trigger on one of those products. Um, what you have to keep in mind, however, is that it is so young and those spinosids are so critical and so valuable that we don't want to overuse the tool because we are limited on the amount that we're able to use in this life cycle of the plant. So, it is up to the PCA and up to the, the threshold that you're seeing to determine if this is the time to pull the trigger. Now there are other products organically that we can use, uh, such as repellents, um, to repel the pests. Uh, however, those don't really knock down and kill. There are some other products out there that we're trialing today, uh, such as cinnamon oils, that will kill the insects on contact. So that is why it is critical for the eggs to be hatched, first instar, feeding, and then the cinnamon oil will contact and kill. Um, so we don't have very many tools organically and that's why we have to be very specific with the ones that we use and the timings that we use them. Uh, again, the spinosids, uh, like I said, are limited on the volume you can put out, but when you're using them in, junction, in conjunction with um, other organic solutions such as neem oils or garlic oils or cinnamon oils, you're going to have a better overall coverage and preventative program in your organic head lettuce. Products such as uh, garlic oils and cinnamon oils are so critical because they have a zero PHI and you could be in an instance where you're harvesting part of the field and on the other half of the field you have an insect problem or an outbreak that you still need to control. And so those types of products and are, are the tools that you want to use, um, the zero PHI, the zero REIs in those harvesting scenarios. And so what you're seeing in one corner of the field could be completely different from what you're seeing on the other. Um, and unfortunately, we don't really spot treat like that with chemistries yet. We're not there yet. Uh, however, um, if you see that there is an alfalfa field across the street getting cut, specifically organically, that's something you just want to go ahead and spray because you can assume and know that those pests from that alfalfa field are going to migrate to your lettuce field. And organically, if you're seeing insects and you're seeing damage, it's already too late because you want to be ahead of the ball. So if, if you see that there's a crop being harvested such as alfalfa or cotton that um, can, you know, historically just collect a lot of trash bugs is what they like to call them, you can assume they're going to hop on into your field. So being preventative and um, doing what you can diligently is, is ideal. So something we need to consider when we're controlling pests in an in a organic field is the level of damage that we're willing to tolerate versus a conventional field. In organics, again, the chemistries aren't systemic and they don't have a residual and they're not able to last long and control a pest for a long period of time. What you're killing in organic, you're killing on the spot and then you have to continue to apply. So the shippers and the packers do have a little bit more tolerance for damage on organic produce. Uh, the market is just, is that, it's organic and so therefore the consumer is a little bit more forgiving. However, in the conventional market, we can't rely on any damage or any kind of pests in the field. The consumer wants the product completely spotless and so therefore that's where we have the harsher tools to kind of come out and the bigger guns to knock the pests down and keep them clean. So in cotton, for example, we can tolerate a little bit more damage because we are relying heavily on the predator-prey ratio. In lettuce, we can't use the natural enemies for any kind of control because we want a clean product and so even if we have beneficial bugs such as a lady beetle, the consumer in the grocery store doesn't like that. So the human, consu the human consumed um, crops are where we want to keep clean and we don't really have the technology to rely on the natural enemies. So a very um, 
prevalent issue right now in head lettuce is INSV. It is vectored by thrips. And so generally something to keep in mind uh, when we do have an outbreak such as INSV is to monitor your thrips heavily. Um, there's a product organically like we talked on earlier, the spinosids that will knock down your thrips. Um, another thing to keep in mind is your nutritional program because having a healthier overall more sound plant is going to go ahead and prevent from those viruses setting on and causing plant damage. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, I think I think what Macy pointed out were a couple of things that um, that um, are important important to note. One of them is, is that um, she talked about scouting right up front and she talked about thresholds and they're the same whether you're organic or you're conventional that portion of IPM is absolutely the same. She pointed it out much like Alex did in the previous video. Um, she did she did point out about spinosids and that's been a godsend if you will for the organic industry particularly for LEPs and thrips as she mentioned. Um, one of the issues that we deal with we I shouldn't say deal with one of the things that we consider that could be potentially a challenge as we go through time is resistance, particularly the spinosin, since they are so effective and they are heavily relied on. As she mentioned, the alternatives, there's not a lot of alternatives in organic production to achieve the standard of quality that a lot of these growers and shippers demand, as well as the consumers. Um, she pointed out a number of repellents, uh, neem products, etc. The one she, she forgot to mention was BT. And BT for the lips, for the army worms loopers, that's, that seems to be the natural um, rotational products. She's absolutely correct in trust, or excuse me, spinosad, it's got a limited use. You can use a total of, I believe, 28 or 29 ounces. So you have to be conservative on when you apply. A lot of that can be achieved by banding down, um, putting a five ounce rate, but if you band it by 50%, you're only putting two and a half ounces on that acre. So you, there are little tricks like that that are completely legal, completely legit, but we've also got products like BTs, several different formulations that can be used in rotation that are uh, probably the second most effective against that species. But other than that, she's absolutely correct. Organic has, has, has found a real niche in our system. Um, she did point out one thing that I, I, uh, I think is important and I think a lot of PCAs pick up on when they're walking fields before they actually stop to cut plants is you see a weak plant or a strange plant and first thing you first thing a lot of guys will do will look at the root systems is there something going on with the roots are they nice and healthy and white or are they stunted are the root hairs pruned etc cetera, etc cetera. so i think that that was an important thing that she pointed out that uh, and again every pca is a little bit different but uh, as time goes on uh, those are really really important factors so in fact uh, organic Productions growing in this leafy vegetable deal here in the desert, particularly for the lettuces, and uh, it's it's not going away. It seems to be uh, real, real popular, and uh, IPM is a critical component of that, whether it be for insects, diseases, weeds, etc. And um, I think uh, as time goes on, we're going to get better. I should say the industry is going to get better at either finding new tools or finding new techniques in uh, either culturally or chemically managing these pests. Now we're going to visit with Gordon Goodwin, a longtime PCA here in Yuma who watches a variety of crops. And I've got a lot of respect for Gordon because he, of the questions he asked me uh, numerous times in the course of the year. So I know that he's a curious fella and he thinks a lot. So he's going to talk to us about inspecting and sampling uh, lettuce in the fall. Hi, my name is Gordon Goodwin. I'm a pest control advisor here in Yuma, Arizona. I've been here for 24 years as an active pest control advisor. I work for Fertizona Yuma, specializing in vegetables, vegetable seed crops, alfalfa, cotton, lemons, and durum wheat. Usually you walk different quadrants of the field and try to assess what's going on as far as the insect activity, and the stage of growth that the iceberg lettuce is in, and it's very important. Today, Bill, we will be inspecting iceberg lettuce for insects and diseases, and I will be showing you how to inspect a field, action treatments, the products to use, and the methods of application. 
Today we might find army worms, western flower thrips, green peach aphid, lettuce aphid, foxglove aphid. Today I'm inspecting a fall iceberg lettuce crop, inspecting for army worms and downy mildew. And right now I'm cutting open iceberg heads to look at the contamination, if any, for army worms. Army worms can be an extremely bad pest. Early on in the iceberg lettuce production at seedling stage, they can wipe out a lettuce stand very quickly within a matter of hours. And then at the heading stage, when the iceberg lettuce starts to make a head, you have to clean it up for, for worms so they do not contaminate the heads. Also, downy mildew is a disease that's become pretty prevalent in the Yuma area in the last 15 years. And we need to inspect the lettuce for traces or severity of the downy mildew disease. It's usually best to treat before you see it, since this disease takes several weeks to show itself. Look, this lettuce is about to head in and I need to treat it for army worm and corn earworm because in the fall, if you don't spray on time, you'll have lettuce contamination with army worm or corn earworm or both, and that's an issue. So at this stage, if the field's dry, I will put a ground sprayer in, usually treat with radiant insecticide anywhere from six to eight ounces. I'll probably also throw a pyrethroid insecticide, maybe warrior, uh, mustang, or permethrin to knock down a moth flight and kill some trash bugs as we go. And generally speaking, when I find this, the first call is made to the farmer. The farmer will say, okay, Gordon, we got a dry field, you can put a ground rig in. The next thing I'll do is get a hold of an applicator, if it's a ground spraying company or if it's a grower's own spray rig, I'll line that up. I'll write a recommendation, email that recommendation to our office the applicator and the grower. I also have to take into consideration what's around me. If I'm spraying with an airplane, I've got to be careful about my neighbors because airplanes do drift, so I got to make sure that the product I'm spraying on my field is labeled with the neighboring crops so I don't get everybody in trouble. Also, I have to find out when they're going to stick a weeding crew in because every insecticide has a reentry interval. So I can't spray tonight with a 12 hour reentry period and have a crew weeding the lettuce the next morning. I've got to make sure that nobody's going to be around the next day until that reentry interval has been satisfied. Um, there's environmental conditions. Uh, I prefer to use methylated seed oils or surfactants with my sprays to imp improve the performance and make sure I don't have any live insects after I spray. Let's see what we have here. Right now I'm inspecting this head of lettuce to see if there are any army worms that are contaminated. As you can see, it's in the late heading stages. So by now I shouldn't have any army worms or corn earworm infecting this lettuce because if you spray too late, the worms are inside the head and they can't sell it. So I'm just gonna keep cutting and looking for uh, entry points where a army worm might have bored through and looking inside to see if there's any corn worms. Uh oh, we were a little late on this one. But generally speaking, you need to treat right before heading. And I've been a licensed PCA for 24 years. Sometimes you can walk through a field, never find a worm. And if you don't treat it, you can come back in several days and have a heavy infestation. So it's almost an automatic thing to treat iceberg lettuce pre-heading to control corn earworm and army worm. Okay, it's been about two days since I've treated for army worm and I'm going through these heads and the inside of the head is clean. I don't have any contamination now that might not be the case every time folks. Once in a while you might have an edge or two that's a little dirty, maybe the applicator missed. 
but generally speaking this feels good so far we're in good shape once in a while I'll find a little bit of a feeding sign where there was a worm or a dead worm on the outer leaflet uh, on the outer leaves that generally get trimmed off during harvest so they don't go in a carton so we're okay my crew did a great job. We were on time with the spray rig, good coverage, no issues, and we're in good shape. Uh-oh, I've got an issue. I only went about four ounces of radiant. I've got dead worms, but I also have live ones still. And it looks like a few of these are getting into the head. I need to make a phone call and get this fixed right away. Some of these heads are still going to be contaminated. Hopefully the percentage is not too high where they won't harvest the field. But it's very important to put a strong enough rate so you get an effective kill. Otherwise you'll be in trouble like I am. That was a good one. Uh, Gordon, Gordon did it right. Uh, he, he's obviously experienced. He knows what he's talking about. He's been doing it well enough. I, a couple of things I would point out First of all was, he, he mentioned preventative treatments. When that plant's starting to cup over, head in, um, it's our university recommendation, and these guys know it from experience, that you almost need to go in preventatively, whether you can find a lot of leps or not, particularly in the fall. We're talking October, early November, for corn earworm and certainly armyworm. Um, last year was a good example. We had none, but every once in a while you'll get a pocket in Dome Valley or Yuma Valley where it'll happen. So he's, he, he, he nailed something that comes through experience and that is treating things preventatively. And uh, that's because the threshold is zero. Like he mentioned, he can't have worms in the head. So we treat preventatively to prevent that zero. Um, the second thing that both he and Alex, uh, they mentioned uh, and, and Gordon specifically mentioned uh, talking to uh, the irrigation or the, uh, the labor crews. Uh, and understanding your PHIs, understanding when there's going to be crews in and out of those fields, um, that's, that's critical. I would, I would term it maybe a long way. Communication's critical with these guys. If it's the irrigation foreman, if it's the uh, tractor foreman's, uh, you know, and he gets out working with the, the growers and the managers, that, that multi-way communication's critical. Uh, sometimes it's hard to reach these PCAs in the fall, uh, particularly in the fall, because they're always on the phone. Uh, if they're not walking, well, heck, even when they're walking, they're talking. Uh, walking and talking, that's what these guys do um, to make sure that there's no mistakes. Uh, he mentioned MSOs, uh, using adjuvants. Not always necessary, but I'm a big proponent of using adjuvants. He mentioned methylated seed oils. That's a great choice. Some products require it for penetration, but it also atomizes the spray and uh, makes for a much more uniform, good application. And then... Um, and then the last thing he mentioned was always use the proper rate. You know, the, the manufacturers have their X rates, recommended rates. Our recommendations usually follow those pretty darn closely. And again, from experience, as he mentioned, he knows he needs to be up there at five or six relative to four. Um, sometimes you get pushback from the growers, but a good PCA will tell you, look, we know that you've got to use this rate. And so that's that's uh, that was very very good. That's 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 the the voice of, of experience. Now let's go back to the research farm and see what's changed since our last visit uh, a few months ago. Well, this experimental block right here, really, we've had trials, different trials specifically for cabbage looper, beet armyworm, um, but this little area that we visited 50 days ago. Um, there's been nothing. Nothing's happened at all in terms of pest management. No insecticides, nothing. So it's, it's approaching harvest. Um, uh, it, it commercial, by commercial standards, it would be harvested this week, maybe early next week. So it's, it's at that point. So what's interesting, what we're in here now is that you can actually see the effects of not treating for, for the leps, specifically beet armyworm and looper. Basically, as you walk across this, much like a harvest foreman would, or, or certainly a PCA, you can start to see damage, feeding damage, holes in the cap leaves and the wrapper leaves. You can see frass, that's the excrement from the worms on top of the lettuce. And oftentimes, if you cut the, the head open, 
take the first couple layers off, you'll actually find the feeding damage in there as well as the larvae itself, which in all those cases, that's unacceptable for quality. Most of the time that would be passed over or if it was bad enough, they may reject the whole field. Sure, you see all stages. You can find newly hatched larvae, uh, very small, all the way to fully mature, uh, maybe an inch long. And then you, sometimes you will find pupae actually in there. Cabbage looper tend to, more so cabbage looper because they tend to web themselves on into the plant. Beet armyworm tend to drop more into the soil or towards the bottom of the plant. So, but nonetheless, you'll see all life stages. Even sometimes you'll find adults tucked in there trying to stay warm on a cool day. It's called a hyaline grass bug or a hyaline seed bug. It's, uh, it's not really damaging the lettuce, but it's a contaminant. And if you get enough of them like there are, once the, it'll end up in the final product, which a lot of consumers don't want to see anything. They're scared to death of this, something like that. Um, it's harmless. No, the eggs are embedded in the leaf tissue and you don't see them very often. You see the larvae and mainly the adults and we've been seeing them all, all fall. They've been around, um, had, had lots of PCA semi-images of them and they're seed feeders. They, um, they're basically looking for something to, to sustain themselves, but they're actually the major pest of lettuce, uh, lettuce grown for seed, seed production, lettuce seed production. Um, we've been seeing more and more of them the last few years. Might be because it's, so dr it's been so dry in the desert, forcing a lot of stuff to come in, as opposed to living on the desert landscape. Well, we don't grow a lot of seed here, and it's the fact that it's here just means that, I'm not sure why we see it. It's, it's, it, it's throughout the desert. It, there's, it'll feed on other grass seeds as well, probably sedan grass. Um, treatment is pretty simple. They're pretty susceptible to pyrethroids. So most PCAs would pre-harvest, put a pyrethroid in the knock, what's often confirmed, at, um, often um, called trash bugs, ligus bugs, these seed bugs, uh, buffalo tree hoppers, those type of things. Bugs that aren't really damaging the crop, but they're contaminants, much like an aphid would be in the spring. You know, part of the problem with these trash bugs is you can kill them, but sometimes you end up with dead bugs on the plant. So it, it's a tough deal. It's in the desert, PCAs are always faced with this challenge of, well, what do I do with these incidental contaminants? Do I spray them and they're dead on the plant? That's no, in many respects, no different than being alive on the plant. So that's, that's a tough one. Um, usually the earlier you spray, the better chance that they're not dead or alive there um, when that product's harvested. How much communication takes place? Um, cell phones have kind of probably been a blessing and a curse in that respect, because you can talk to people instantly, but there's, all, there's so much communication because if you're going to treat a field, you gotta make sure that there's no labor crew coming in the next day, there's no tractor work being done, there's no irrigation being done. You've gotta be able to coordinate all these things. Um, once the field's been sprayed, is it cleared? You know, all little, little details like that that go on that people don't, probably don't even know about or consider um, when we think about pest management. We think about the actual tactics or strategies or the products we use, but man, um, the scouting based on the PCA is critical. And then that communication between everybody involved, whether it's an irrigation guy, a labor guy, the grower, the shipper, go down the list. This is probably what lettuce should look like close to harvest, got a really good frame on it. You cut that back. Real good, good frame on that plant. You know, that's what you want to see clean. A little bit of dirt from dust, but that's something you want to see in a grocery store, right? You want to buy that. You want to put that in a box or put plastic wrap that. Pretty clean head of lettuce. So this is what it should look like. Again, like I said, it's, my hands are dirty, but that's a, a pretty crisp, crisp head lettuce or iceberg or head lettuce. That's what, that's about the size it should be. That's what, if you go into the grocery store this time of the year, that's probably what you're seeing. It's got really good firmness, really good quality. This is the antithesis of that. There's a plant that undoubtedly got hit 
early. When we were out here 50 days ago, those worms that were feeding on that plant, one of the things that they do is they set that plant back. We talked about that, and that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing a plant that never really developed much of a frame because it was chomped on. It was set back by the feeding damage, which that stuff's long gone now. That damage, insignificant at, that at this time. But as a consequence of that, what you end up with is this, misshapen, small, not mature, not a good, not what you want. And this is the consequence of um, poor lip management, poor worm management on the front end. And here's a head that probably was on the way to making it, but you can see again, like we've already, I've already demonstrated, quite a bit of damage along the way. Uh, worms feeding on the backside. Pretty clean at this point, probably not too bad, not as good as that one we looked at, but uh, chances are you never know what's underneath this cap leaf. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the one pest that we haven't seen a lot of this year, thankfully, is corn earworm. These, the, the worms that have been doing this damage I've been explaining are mainly beet armyworm and cabbage looper. The feeding holes, the frass they leave behind. Problem with corn earworm is, is that when they lay the eggs back on these leaves, that larvae wants to go straight into the head. It just bore itself right into the head and you never see it and you can't get to it until after you harvest. And what ends up happening is they will have fed all through here. And it'll look pretty good from this perspective, but when the housewife or the consumer cuts it open, they're going to be real surprised. Um, it's pretty much useless. It, you get a lot of rot inside of there from, from their feeding. But again, like I said, we've been lucky this year. We haven't seen a lot of that, um, a lot of that damage um, locally or and certainly not in, the, in these trials. You typically see them, like when we were out here in, in September, you get flights and they lay eggs, you know, sometimes in patches, sometimes throughout the whole block. Um, those things hatch and you get these overlaying egg lays and you'll get overlaying generations. And so it's just a, it's a constant battle or it can be if you don't use the right um, insecticides. Um, and then they can kind of straggle on. You'll get flights throughout September, throughout October. You'll walk out there one day and wow, where'd all these new eggs come from? And you can anticipate that within a couple of days there will be new larvae. Of course, by that time, the plant's a little bit able, more able to tolerate that feeding but like that little plant I just showed you, you don't want that to happen too much because then you start getting impacts on that plant. This time of the year, um, you still get it, but we're getting to the point where the cooler nights, um, moths and lep, the, the larvae and the moths, the adults, they're, they're cold blooded. So the cooler it is, the less they develop, the less they move, the less they grow. So with these cooler nights that we're experiencing, particularly when you get out towards Roll and Tacna, they're not, they're not as active. The moths aren't as active. They're not laying as many eggs. Even when they do lay eggs, it takes longer for the egg to hatch. So, but that's not a reason to, uh, to give up on them because the, the potential is always there. So here we are, mid-November. Um, we're warm for November, although by the end of this week, it's supposed to start to cool down a little bit. But um, we're a little bit above average, but by December, we'll be back to cool nights and cool days, 70 degree days, maybe some 60s. And again, because insects are poikilothermic or cold blooded, it really slows down their activity. It doesn't shut them down at all. Now, I would say through December and January, um, insect activity on a whole, lep activity, worm activity is pretty light. It's pretty rare to see new eggs, new larvae. But once it starts to warm up late January, February, March, all bets are off. Here they come, especially cabbage looper, but armyworm too. So it's not as intense as it's been the last 60 days or so, but it'll be enough to where a PCA will have to spend a lot of time looking and making sure they don't get damaged. Um, right now we're kind of in a transition period where we're at the tail end. We've had some thrip in the fall. Uh, we've had some thrip, I would say about average that we typically see. Um, they're actually going to start to trend downward with the cooler temperature as well. Um, but what's starting to show up and will be a big deal in the spring are aphids. Aphids, uh, I've seen 
people have sent images in. I've seen them on our broccoli, mainly on the coal crops now, but you'll see green peach aphid in particular. They're starting to, to colonize a little bit, uh, not to the point of causing a lot of damage, but uh, this time of the year, it's you do see a little activity, a little damage sometimes. It's really January, February, March that you, that's when they can really take off. The thing that makes them different from all the other pests that we have is that they're what I call cool season insects. Their developmental rates are optimal in the 60s, the mid to low 60s. So when it's 60 on an average of 60, 62 degrees, those things are at their peak. Everything else, whiteflies, armyworm, even thrips, they're suppressed because they're what we call warm season pests. So you've got thrips that are important because of the weather. Uh, excuse me, aphids that are important because it's cooler. And then they just start to grow all the way towards till the end of the season. So that's starting to occur now. People are aware that they're out there. And then the other thing is, is that it's too hot um, and the hosts that we grow in the summer aren't acceptable to aphids, green peach aphid in particular. So they disappear. They're gone. They're not even around all summer long. And that's why when we trap them from September in October, we don't see aphid, but last couple of weeks with these big winds coming out of the north and coming out of the west, all of a sudden aphids are picking up. And that's because they've been moving out of the central coast mountains on the wind currents all the way down through the desert, Coachella, Imperial, and then here in Yuma. So they move with the winds every fall. That's how we get reinfested every year. So that, or, and in some cases we've seen it, they'll come in on transplants. Um, usually from the coast, transplants that are grown on the coast. Sometimes you'll get infestations that come in there, but those are generally pretty easy to take care of and very, very localized to that one particular field. In the next module, we're going to see how the pest spectrum changes as we go into the winter and into the spring under cooler temperatures. Hi, it's Macy again, and we're out here where we solved the armyworm problem in the lettuce field. It was the fall and now the temperatures have changed, it's uh, the winter time and so the pest problems have shifted a little bit where we're not so much worried about the armyworm and the thrip as we are aphid and other um, issues out in the field. So we'll go ahead and take a look. So as the weather changes and shifts, so does the pest spectrum. So in, in this lettuce we can go ahead and see that in the terminals, there are a little bit of aphid issues, um, some lettuce aphid and some green peach. Um, these are issues that can be controlled with um, a fully selective chemistry or um, a broad spectrum. This time of the year and at this cycle, I would say a, more of a broad spectrum would kill any kind of aphid or thrip that you're seeing but then a more selective product, such as a Movento, would kill um, any aphids on the inside, outside, and any that continue to feed. Um, you can also see some adults out here, so you know that there's nymphs at different stages and adults that are gonna be laying more nymphs. So this is definitely a time to control the aphid. So now that we've identified which active ingredient we're going to use, we're gonna look at the label for that chemistry. From the label, we're going to calculate the rate that we're going to use and what acreage we're going to apply. From there, we write the recommendation, give it to the applicator along with the 1080 form. So I'm back in the field four days after application to see if it was a successful application. We're starting to see some aphids dying and uh, although there is some activity, we have to give a little bit longer for the material to work, but since we're starting to see some dead, we can go ahead and assume that it was a successful application. So I'm back in the field a week after application and what I'm starting to see is actually more aphid nymphs and not any kind of um, slowness of them or any kind of dead nymphs. So I think it's time to reevaluate the chemistry that we used. Either we calculated the wrong rate or it was applied wrong or if we just kind of missed the window on it altogether we need to go back and make another decision and pull the trigger because the aphid numbers are getting greater. Well, I got to this field, I better look at it. 
First of all, I'm going to glass it and see if there's any goofy patterns out there or anything that might just stick out. But I'm going to start inspecting. I'm going to start from the edges because that's where most of the issues start with. Basically work myself into the center of the field. Look for the insects that are uh, usually the main problems for the certain time of year and growth stage. Keep inspecting. Get a good idea of the percentage of plants that are infected and what kind of time I have to get things treated. It's the spring now and I'm checking this younger romaine lettuce. I'm looking for western flower thrip, red lettuce aphid, an occasional army worm. Those insects alone can make this product or this romaine unmarketable. So at this moment I'm looking and I do have a heavy infestation of lettuce aphid. I'll probably use a product called Movento insecticide. It's a systemic, it requires a methylated seed oil in order for it to work. This particular block, we might be a little late. The aphid are already colonizing to a heavy degree. Aphids in general are asexual and do not need to mate to reproduce. So their reproductive cycle is very quick. While I'm spraying this, I do have a few western flower thrips. So I'll have to add radiant in insecticide to the mix. And I might add a pyrethroid to keep away any false cinch bug or any other trash insects that we do not want in this product. Next thing I have to do is figure out how many acres this field is. I'll look at my map book and my schedule that the produce grower has given me. I'll contact the grower. The field's dry so I can get a ground sprayer in. I'll make sure I don't have a weeding crew in here the next few days. The Movento product is a 24-hour worker re-entry, so I need at least a day of nobody around to treat. And I need to get on this very quickly. Time's running out. Well, about a week and a half ago, I treated for thrip and aphid, and finally, I don't see any aphid on these plants, which is a good thing because the Movento, as good as it is, it takes a while to work. And once in a while I'll see a western flower thrip adult, but no nymphs. And the immature thrips are the ones that do the scarring, or the majority of the scarring, so I've, I think we've done a pretty good job here. Just got to keep re-inspecting these fields to make sure nothing else gets, gets in them. Uh-oh, I've got an issue. I've got a little bit of phytotoxicity in this romaine. Several days ago, I treated for red lettuce aphid with Movento and western flower thrips with radiant, but I also added a few fungicides in. And I also had powdery mildew. I put a little bit of sulfur and oil together, and those two didn't mix. And now I've got a little bit of burn. Now I've got to evaluate, are these lettuce, is this romaine lettuce, the leaves that are on here, will they end up in a carton? or will they be trimmed off at harvest? Can't do that, you gotta really watch what you're mixing things with. No, you know, it was interesting. Uh, Macy brought up the whole, the point about, uh, you know, reevaluation, and that's that's critical. You know, that's the point where you make a decision, do I treat, treat again or do I retreat? That's all about scouting, and that's why growers visit, PCAs visit fields numerous times a week. Um, when we talk about aphids in a few minutes, it's important to note that, uh, you know, sometimes when you evaluate, sometimes you still see aphids after an application, but with a product like Mavento, which is, um, as Gordon mentioned, it's systemic, but it also has IGR-like properties. And so what it basically does is it prevents the insect from growing. And what you'll end up seeing is you'll see the uh, adults on the plants, but they're not are not uh, laying live young. They're not reproducing necessarily in the field, which is a good sign. 
Um, you can't completely eliminate them, but the fact that you're not seeing a lot of small nymphs, it's a pretty good sign that the product's working. Um, uh, you, Gordon mentioned the edges. That's one of the first places I look uh, when I'm starting a, a trial, or certainly if I was scouting a field, particularly with aphids, because they do tend to blow in from the west. Um, the windward, the windward edge is a, probably a good place to start. You still need to inspect the field for other things, but for aphids, you can typically find them on the edges. And then um, uh, the pyrethroid, the whole part about the pyrethroid, you know, it's those products have been around since the 70s. They're still effective on certain pests, but as has been mentioned numerous times by both M Macy and uh, and uh, Gordon that they're broad spectrum. So you take a selective product that's targeting a, an individual insect or group of insects, yet you've got other things you need to take care of. You, that's where the pyrethroid comes into play. It, it provides broader spectrum. Uh, and it's still a soft, relatively soft chemistry without having to come in with the, the hammer or the, or the old chemistry. So, yeah. So let's talk about aphids. Um, you know, aphids are unusual here in the desert. It's, you've got the changes in this pest spectrum. In the fall, it's generally the laps. Beet armyworm, cabbage looper, bar none are the, the number one problem, number one pest. Statistics bear that out. Year in and year out, over the, the years I've been down here, aphids are probably the, the spring pest, the problem that we work worry about most in the spring. Thrips are a close second, but let's talk about aphids. Um, we have a, a, a spectrum of about five key species that show up every year on lettuce. Um, you could throw two or three more species of aphids that show up on spinach, celery, uh, brassica crops. But these five majors, They've pointed both of them out. Green peach aphid is one that's here every single year. We find it um, year in, year out. Typically shows up about January. Sometimes on some of the brassica crops, you'll see it in December. But on lettuce, it, it tends to show up um, in the what we call the early spring, early January. Lettuce aphid is, an, uh, is the second most uh, important species, and it typically shows up later. I say that typically because um, over the last 20 years that it's been uh, introduced into the area, that's when we typically see it with warmer temperatures. And so they're still cool season pests, these two species of aphids, but green peach aphids prefer a much cooler temperature as opposed to lettuce aphid, a little, probably five to 10 degrees warmer. We're still talking somewhere between 60 and, you know, 55 and 65 degrees. Um, so as a, as a consequence of our cropping system, lettuce aphid generally really blows up a little bit later, more like mid-February to mid-March as opposed to January. Having said that, last year we had a phenomenal, that last year being the spring of 2022, we had a phenomenal outbreak of lettuce aphid. They showed up in December, which is really unusual. And uh, there were there were growers disking fields because they were so bad. Uh, and a lot of damage was taken in certain cases. A lot, of, a lot more spraying that would typically be done, uh, particularly with products like Mavento, as, uh, as Gordon pointed out. The thing to know about aphids is these, these, these different species, it's really real critical to be able to identify them, um, particularly green peach versus lettuce aphid, because they uh, attack the plant differently. Green peach aphid is a, and you'll we'll see images of them, is a much different aphid species. It, it tends to colonize the crown of the plant. And as a consequence of that, it can be difficult to reach with certain insecticides, but if it's if the spray timing's proper, you can keep those things from really blowing up and ultimately moving up into the head, which is where economic damage, contamination, because aphids aren't, the aphid feeding by itself isn't affecting the growth of the plant. Um, unless you just get an enormous number on small plants, which just doesn't happen. It's not the way we grow crops here. Um, in, in contrast to that, lettuce aphid tends to colonize straight to the growing point, like both Macy and Gordon pointed out, they go straight to the, the growing point and they colonize. And as that plant starts to grow and curl over, if you haven't cleaned them up before that plant starts to cup over, well, they're just, they got a nice little protective environment there to, to, to thrive in. And at that point, um, it's contamination becomes a real issue. 
Um, and it's really difficult to reach them, obviously, with contact or even translaminar insecticides. That's why the product Mavento, uh, a systemic insecticide, has been a godsend because you can spray over the top of the field and actually reach those, those pests. Very slow acting. But we have other products, other aphicides that have been developed in the last five to six years that, that, that are good complements to use on a season-wide program. Um, there are three, uh, and, I, and again, it goes back into evaluating aphids. There's three stages of aphids. There's winged aphids, which are the what we call the alates. Those are adults, winged adult aphids. Those are the ones that are migrating or dispersing into the lettuce crop itself. Um, they are all females. All aphids that we have in our system are females. They're parthenogenic. They, li they, they uh, deposit live young. They don't lay eggs. They actually lay live young. Um, and as a consequence of that, every single one of those live young is a clone of its mother. And when that young nymph develops into an adult, she lays eggs that are clones. So you have these just, they're all identical sp clones of each other and they're all females and they're all capable of putting out more aphids. That's why you can go from a few today to an enormous number in, in, a, in a week or two. Their life cycle for green peach is about, I think for lettuce aphid as well, it's about 10 days to go from being laid as a, a small nymph until a full-blown reproductive adult. So you can see that a lot can happen uh, in a short period of time. And, and keep in mind that lettuce is growing much slower during this period because of the weather scooter. Um, there's three, there's three stages. There's the alate, then there's a wingless, an adult that's, that doesn't have wings, that's a reproductive uh, uh, aphid. And then there are the true nymphs. And sometimes it's confusing and it's, it's important to discern between a wingless ad, uh, adult and a nymph. They're, you can usually tell by the size Something like lettuce aphid, you can tell by the, the color. Uh, a, a wingless adult is brown. A nymph is red. Green peach is not, they're, they're essentially they look very, very similar, but size gives a difference. And the important thing, reason I bring that up is that, again, after a spray treatment, you may have some of these larger adults hanging around. Um, because they're fully developed. They're not maybe feeding on some of these systemic products. But what you're not seeing are the young nymphs being produced. They're not, they're not laying these live nymphs. And that's a good sign that the product is picking up the nymphs that are actively feeding on the plant or coming in contact. So in terms of reevaluation, so aphids are, are really important. Uh, the important thing for a PCA to know though is that they're a contaminant. Um, that's why we don't want them around. That's why management is critical because they get in and they contaminate the head, head lettuce. Not just with the, their physical presence, but every time a nymph molts from one instar to the next, like a snake, it sheds its skin. The exuvia that's put off, well, it remains in the head or on the outside of the head as well. And the other thing is, is that particularly for some of the romaine hearts or even uh, bagged lettuce that you see in the stores, um, it sits in that nice little environment and those dead or even live aphids can cause the growth of mold within. I, I've seen that. You pull back and where did all this mold come from? Well, it's oftentimes it can come from the sooty mold from the insect or from the insect itself. So that contamination, it's all about aesthetics, cosmetic quality with a lot of this product and aphids are just notorious for causing problems there. So after scouting, insect identification, and product selection, let's see how the PCA works with the applicator to make sure that job gets done right. When you're trying to figure out what to spray, uh, the label is the law. Uh, you got to abide by everything the label says. Uh, starters, uh, your crop has to be under the label. If your crop is not under the label, you cannot apply that chemical. Another thing, you got to stay within your rates. Uh, you can't go over your rates. If it's a uh, 46 ounces, you can't apply a 10 ounce rate on that field because it's no longer legal. It's not under the label. Um, and most importantly, you got to check your REIs, which are your re-entry intervals, um, to be able to walk in the field. Some products take four hours, six, 10, 12, maybe even 24 hours. Uh, so you always got to make sure you take a look at that label and see if you're going to be able to walk in it. If it's a 24-hour product and you applied it last night at 8. You will not be able to walk in it today at 8 in the morning. You got to wait till 8 at night till it's safe to walk in. Um, 
within that time period that the label states, if it's 24 hours, you walk in 10 hours later, that chemical is still in the field and still pretty, pretty hazardous to, to the person walking in. And if you do have to walk in for you know, any reason, uh, you have to wear the right PPE, which is the personal protective equipment. And um, yeah, and another thing you look at the label um, is the harvest interval. Um, for example, if this field is being harvested this Saturday and I want to use a certain product to treat the field and it says um, it's a seven day uh, harvest interval, you know, re-entry to the field, I wouldn't be able to apply that product because it's a seven day period and I only have two days to harvest. Um, but if it were to be harvested next Saturday, I'd have that time period to be able to apply that chemical, you know, those seven days. Um, these also vary. Um, every chemical varies on their REIs and on their harvest intervals, um, obviously rates. Um, everything varies uh, depending on the chemical. So yeah, it's a, you always got to keep an eye on that label. Make sure you know your labels. Make sure you read your labels if you don't know them before making a decision on applying any of these products. Uh, you got to always keep, keep an eye on that label because, uh, like I said, uh, the label is the law. If you don't abide by the label, uh, you'll get yourself in trouble. Well, the only thing I would I would mention would be uh, on every label there on, on the upper right hand corner of the front page is the IRAC Insecticide Resistance Action Committee group number and th and that number relates to a mode of action um, specifically for that chemical and groups of chemicals similar chemicals and 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 for resistance management we always preach to rotate your chemistry so you you can use that number if you're not familiar with the chemistry of that particular compound that. That IRAC group number will tell you that uh, I used a 23 today. Next time, I better rotate to something else, a 5 or a 2 or what have you. Um, now we're going to talk about the Form 1080, and that's the uh, prescription, if you will, of the chemical application that's actually going to be uh, applied to the field. PCAs are required by law, as are growers, to fill one of these forms out when a commercial application is made to a, a lettuce crop. Um, once that form is filled out, it's actually sent to the applicator, but it's also sent to the Department of Agriculture. And it's the Department of Agriculture's role to uh, regulate the use of pesticides in the state of Arizona, as is in, in California. Very, very stringent. Um, you know, a lot of people complain about regulations, but it's really a good way to um, quantify and, and legitimize the fact that we're actually applying these pesticides correctly under the federal label um, as is required by FIFRA. It's also good for uh, keeping track in-house internally for a grower or a pest control advisor as to what he's actually done in that field. You know, the, the other thing that's great about uh, the Form 1080, particularly in the state of, state of California, they have 100% use reporting. So that goes into a uh, every time it's all digitally entered, it goes into the large database, and essentially they're always a year behind, but that data is available uh, online. In Arizona, we have a little bit different process. That's Once these forms are, are sent to the Department of Ag, they do their fact-checking, uh, and then they're sent to the University of Arizona up at Maricopa Ag Center, where those that data, that information is actually loaded uh, into a database, and we have access, anybody has access, public access to it, but we use that data a lot just to verify rates of products, which products are being used, which crops are being used on. And that's important because uh, not only can we uh, look for trends in certain usage in certain years, but as we've done in the past several years is we've shown that a lot of this newer, softer, reduced risk chemistry um, that's... Uh, very environmentally eco-friendly, IPM friendly, we're seeing increases in that chemistry, whereas the older chemistry that's more broad spectrum, more broadly toxic, we're actually seeing uh, a, a pretty good dramatic reduction in the uses of those. And that's that's not only good to know for us scientifically, but um, for, even from the growers perspective, because I think a lot of the in, a, lot of, a lot of people outside of the industry, still think we're kind of in the stone age of pest management using old chemistry when in fact it's just the opposite. We've seen this dramatic shift towards new softer chemistry, um, almost benign chemistry, and, and 
and that's a result of science. So 1080s are extremely important, not only for the PCA, as for record keeping, for the applicator, for actually getting the, the right instructions on what's applied and when it's applied. And then from a regulatory perspective, when it goes to the Department of Ag, and they can spot check and make sure that uh, the industry is following the rules as well. So let's go see Alex uh, and the process that he goes through in filling, filling one of these 1080s out. So I'm going to fill out this 1080 uh, for this field. Um, so we're going to start by writing our grower, our grower down. Uh, today's date. And then we're going to choose our crop, whatever crop we're going to be applying this on. And then we're going to write our, our fields down with our acreage. So... Then after we write down our blocks, we're going to add up the, the total acreage. In this case, we're, we're running at 40, 40 acres. And then we're going to be adding, um, writing down our materials with the rates. So in this case, I'm going to be using 5 ounces to the acre. From there, we're going to add that up or multiply that by our acreage. So it's 5 ounces times... 40 acres, that's 200, and we divide that by 128, which is the total gallons, I mean, ounces in a gallon, which is 1.5, so it's one and a half gallons that we're gonna be sending out. Uh, from there, we're gonna go ahead and uh, choose our applicator. In this case, I'm gonna do grower applied, because they have their own equipment. It's gonna be done by ground at 25 gallons uh, dilution rate, and we're gonna ship it to their shop in the valley. And then um, after that, in uh, special instructions, we usually write uh, weather permitting. And avoid drift. Avoid drift, that is to cover us in case of any incident where, you know, the weather doesn't allow for someone to spray or it drifts onto another another field. It, it covers us because we wrote it on a 1080 that to avoid, you know, those, the the bad weather or the drift. Um, and then after that, we're gonna sign our 1080 under PCA. And once we're done, we're gonna just take a look over our 1080, make sure we signed everything, wrote everything down right, and then we signed it. And after that, we're gonna send it out to our applicators. Hello, my name is Cyrus Keith. I'm a branch manager for Farm Aviation. We work with our local PCAs, an aerial application, fixed wing, or helicopter, and we'd like to take you through our process after we receive the 1080 or a recommendation with the PCA. All right, the recommendation is in from the PCA. And print the recommendation. Okay. Um, this has all of our information for what we need from commodity, date proposed to be sprayed, uh, who we're spraying for, who the PCA is, the chemical we're using, the acres of the field, uh, how many gallons per acre it is, we're looking up our field. And then we're printing our maps. All right. We're ready to get together with the logistics team. One. And then we go trifolium 10. We check our locations, maps, make sure that we got the right field and right commodities. Up here? Yeah, for the honesty. Okay. Here we're taking all of our information from the day's work or the night's work. Okay. Uh, logistically setting it up right. in some kind of order so we're not flying back and, back and forth across the valley. We up here? Okay. And our last one's roughly same spot? Yeah, the, the drift fuel is the same, look, green, 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 Okay. All right, so it's mowing. So we're looking at the chemical. 
We have a warning label. So we'll need the proper P PPE for a warning label. Checking our beware. Uh, the beware they have in California helps us keep track of where the beehives are. If we need to make phone calls for them to be moved or if they're okay or with further away than a mile. And as we sort through the recommendations, their 1080s, we have our white copies for the pilots, the yellow copies for the loaders, and we have blue copies for our flaggers so that all of our information is uniform and the same on each copy. Okay guys, give me a call when the, you're loaded up and the fields are clear. And then make sure you have your proper PPE and we'll be ready to go. Thank you. And then as we break apart to each go do our duties, we we'll make sure that if any loader, flagger, handler has or needs any more additional PPE or replacement PPE, the beginning of the day and the night is the time to do it. Okay, George, this is the PPE we're gonna need for tonight. And here's your earplugs. I like the glove. All right. Thank you. See you out in the field. Our chemical was delivered. Here's one of our loader handlers now. He's gonna be taking fresh water with out to the field. So he's adjusting his valves. He's going to hook the quick connect up to the trailer. The big black tank on the trailer is our fresh water source. We have filtrations in case we're taking out of canals and it's muddy. It's got a lot of sand or debris in there that would plug or clog our nozzles and make them malfunction. Daniel's crawling to the top of the truck, make sure that we're getting the fresh water in the tank. Loaders then pull around to our loading dock and they double check their recommendation the same copy as the flagger and the pilot has, and they load the chemical up and organize it per job, per delivery. And then after they load it up, they'll head to the field to get water down, finish organizing, and get ready to mix when the spotter flagger handler says the field is clear. And we decided to go with helicopters for the evening. Our flagger is out in the fields checking for people in the area and clearing the fields to make sure there's no irrigation going on. Now we're gonna do a pre-flight inspection. General condition of the helicopter, main rotor blades, fuselage, tail rotor blades. looking for uh, basically loose nuts, oil levels, wear, where there's not supposed to be wear, movement on any part that's not supposed to move. Go through, check all of our fluids, and we'll make sure we're good to go.
equipment, our lights, our GPS are in good working order. Now as we come to the nozzles, we put our rubber gloves on, going through, checking general condition, again, for bolts, nuts, and then as we come through, we'll start adjusting our nozzles. So depending on what application it is, a herbicide application, a fungicide, insecticide application, we'll adjust our nozzles to gallons per acre so that it would help uh, keep our pressures within, within reason and then it would help if we need to do large droplets or small droplets. Our pre-flight is done with our aircraft. Here we have a loader handler pulling up. We're going to take some rinse water a little bit of rinse water from from the, the base allows a quick calibration for the first load of the night it's just straight water no chemical As he hooked a dry brake up, you can see when he turned the handle that it is a dry lock. The mechanisms inside it pushes a valve that pushes another valve and allows the water and or chemical mix at the time to transfer through. And then he shuts everything off, shut the valves off so that no chemical comes back towards the tank and then disconnects from the dry brake from the load truck to the helicopter. And we're getting ready to go to the field. Those are our blade ties tie downs to help from any damage happening to the helicopter when the wind's blowing and parked overnight or during the day when not in use for application. We're out here at our field we're gonna spray. We've double checked the canal and ditch gate to make sure we're at the right field. We have the commodity of alfalfa. It's been recently flood, flood irrigated. So we're gonna go with the aerial. We're gonna notify the pilot 
of the power lines here at the northwest corner, the stacks of hay. On the north, the tall power lines to the east, and some trailers sitting on the southwest corner. Okay, as our loader handler pulls up to the field, uh, he will have heard on the radio of which way the wind is coming from, so he has an idea of, of where to park. With the helicopter, we want to take off into the wind and land into the wind. You said you were on your way, Jake. Yeah, I've been taking off now. 10-4. Here he's wetting the ground down to uh, cut back on dust. A, a lot of downwash off the helicopter rotor blades, so therefore it causes a lot of dust. Uh, for reasons, neighboring fields, uh, helicopter and loader, helicopter pilot and loader doesn't have to be in so much dust when it's wet down. Here as the helicopter approaches the field, the flagger had told where the power lines are, what we discussed, discussed early, earlier with the bales, the trailers, and the power lines to the east and to the northwest. Uh, he sets up, he gets, gets eyes on all that, and then he sets up for his AB line. Uh, a practice that I usually partake in is setting my AB line before I go pick the load up to make sure that everything that I had set up will work for the particular field. And as he sets down with the helicopter, there's some dust still obviously, can't let the whole area down, but it did help out immensely compared to now Isma on the other side is hooking the dry break up like we saw. Uh, put the chemical water mix into the aircraft, the helicopter. And as he takes off with a full load, as you can see, he stays within ground effect, which helps out with performance of the helicopter. And to me, our work lights look like a sun shot right there. They look pretty, pretty bright work lights, of course traveling anywhere from 50 to 80 mile an hour across any particular field, depending on the length. Uh, we need bright lights, considering we work at night. As he comes through the field, this I believe is a five gallon app, so we have some smaller droplet sizes, but it's still laying down on the commodity, very nice. As the helicopter comes up, turns around and lines back up. Jake is doing a skip swath where he goes across the field doing odds and then starts back over and does evens. That helps for a smaller droplet size as it takes longer to fall that we're not continuously flying through our water chemical mix helps keep us safe and the helicopter clean and we don't have to clean our windows so much.
as you exit and enter a field, it's always important that we have a, an auto cal that helps keep the flow even. So as he's entering the field, he tries to match a speed that he exited the field, but with the auto cal, it helps adjust a valve in, inside there to slow down the rate or speed the rate up, depending if the exit speed and enter speed match or are really different. As he comes out of the field, bleeds off airspeed in the turn, makes his turn, and then enters the field. And, uh, picking up the energy he had lost, coming out and slowing down and gained. And then he goes back across the field. And as the auto, auto cal or the flow control uh, adjust throughout 